Hello friends and welcome to a very belated video, sorry, in the case you don't know this part of my series Quick Thoughts On, in which I always ramble about different stories from the rich Star Trek universe. 50 years and one week ago NBC aired the next episode of the second season of the classic Star Trek show called by any other name, and these are my honest opinions about it. This episode starts with a landing party consisting of Captain Kirk, Dr. McCoy, Spock, a red shirt and a yeoman searching for the survivors which sent a distress call. They are greeted by a man and a woman which have a strange way how to thank them. They request the immediate surrender of the Enterprise. When our heroes don't take them seriously, this couple activates a paralyzing field using their belts which makes the five Enterprise members freeze. I must admit, that's a very strong teaser. While our heroes are paralyzed, the woman, named Kalinda, disarms them and after they are released, Rojan dumps some exposition on us. They are actually scouts from the Kelvin Empire from the Andromeda Galaxy. They will need to find a new home because of the huge radiation levels and now the five scouts want to get back home and report that our galaxy is ready for being taken over. The reason why they want to uh, the Enterprise is uh, the huge energy barrier on the edge of our galaxy. Okay, let's nitpick this for a moment. Is there actually an energy barrier on the edge of our galaxy? Is there a similar barrier on the edge of the Andromeda galaxy? They need the Enterprise and a few of its officers to fly through the barrier. Okay, but who will fly the ship 300 years later? Oh yes, I forgot to say, uh, they will change the engines so that the intergalactic travel will take only 300 years. And what was the plan of the Kelvins? Did they really think that because their galaxy becoming lethal for them soon, it's really a good idea to send scouts to other galaxies to search if any of the galaxies can fit their needs? I mean, how long can such a mission take? They want to travel back for 300 years, uh, so let's say the mission was planned for 600 years? And since the Kelvin lifespan doesn't seem to be much longer than the human lifespan, the mission was started by their ancestors and finished uh, by their offsprings. Judging by humans, let's say that they will have three generations in 100 years, which would mean that after 600 years, the individuals who would come back home would be 18 generations younger than the individuals who left the Kelvin Empire. So do they really assume that in the 18 generations there will be nobody, not a single person who will say, oh screw that, or why should I fulfill an order given centuries ago, centuries before I was born, to my ancestors? I find it really hard to believe. Also, if they are on the way back, let's pretend and this is generation number 9. How is it possible that there are only three men and two women? You know, the more I think about it, the more questions I have and the more dirty it starts to sound to me. But back to the plot, before Kirk gets a chance to object, Rogen informs him that the Enterprise is being boarded. And he's correct. The other three Kelvins, Heinar, Drea and Tomar, without bigger problems, frees uh, all problematic Enterprise crew members and Heinar very soon comes to report that the Enterprise is under their control. The landing party is imprisoned in the near cave and they are guarded by Kalinda. Spock tries to use the mind melt uh, to influence her to open the bars, similar to what he did on Mini R7, but before he is successful, he is literally thrown away from the door, but Kalinda is still curious what is going on, so she comes inside only to get beaten by Kirk. They think they escaped, but nope, they get frozen outside and Rojan decides to punish them for their attempt. He orders the black guy and the yeoman. Why? Uh, well, this is what you get when you go on a mission with Captain Kirk and you wear a red shirt. They get pulled over and turned into dehydrated um, things. I have no clue how is this shape called, so I'm not going to try. Uh, as a demonstration of their power and also a punishment, Rogen takes uh, these two objects in his hands and crushes one of them. 
The other one gets restored to the original human form and I must admit that I was a bit surprised. They killed the woman and kept the man alive. That's not what I expected. The black guy usually dies first in this type of stories and the guy in the red shirt dies uh, first in Star Trek. The woman is usually Captain Kirk's love interest, so good work, I definitely didn't expect that. By the way, I think that this death scene would be more effective if the yeoman would be somebody who we have seen before, for example this would be a perfect way how to get rid of yeoman Jenny Rand. And the way how Kirk takes the white dust to his hands should probably be very dramatic and sad, but I personally find it unintentionally disgusting. Uh, don't forget that this is dehydrated corpse, so which means uh, giving your hands uh, inside and taking some of the white stuff out of it is basically similar to putting uh, your hands inside a dead body and pulling its guts out. Uh, are you disgusted now? When they're back in the prison cell, or prison cave, Spock explains that he has seen the Kelvin's true form. Some sort of giant tentacle creatures, meaning that the human forms they see are basically some sort of shells. They took the form of humans only because the Enterprise was created to be uh, used by bipedal humanoid creatures, so they have now information which they will use in the later acts. When they move back to the ship, Spock and Scotty go to the engine room where they create a possibility to make the ship explode when it enters the barrier. Well, that escalated quickly, didn't it? To be honest, uh, that surprised me a lot. Don't get me wrong, I have nothing against stories in which our heroes sacrifice their lives to defeat the enemy. I usually find this type of stories very inspiring, but uh, is this really a good reason for a suicide? I mean, they didn't even try anything else yet. I am fully on Kirk's side. He reacts uh, like that's the dumbest idea he ever heard when they suggested to him uh, in the turbo lift, and they are suddenly at the barrier. Well, where exactly is this supposed to be taking place when they are at the edge of our galaxy after what seems to be only a few hours after they met the Kelvins? And they fly to the barrier using warp 11. This was before the warp system was recalculated. In the next generation era, warp 10 was considered to be infinite speed. Scotty and Spock wait for Kirk's OK to blow up the ship, but he refuses to do it. So the Enterprise again, for the second time, flies through the Great Barrier. But why doesn't this time nobody from the crew get superpowers? You know, every time you fly through the barrier, all people who have high ESP rates uh, should get zapped and get superpowers. Or did the Sifontana simply forget that it happened? You know, they could solve it with just one line of dialogue, saying uh, something like, uh, thankfully we don't have any espers on board this time or something like that. When they omit a pretty big storyline from the previous encounter and don't explain why, it feels kind of uh, inconsistent. But instead of getting cartoon supervillains, we see that the Kelvin start to change all unnecessary crew members into the white objects. And Rogen says to Kirk that they of course knew about the plan to blow up the ship and that they will prevent it from happening next time. So, okay, we have four of our heroes alive and five of the Kelvins. And we are on a 300 years long journey to the Andromeda galaxy. So, what to do next? Let's eat. Eating will help us come up with a plan. The surviving crew members are Kirk, Spock, McCoy and Scott. When they eat, they meet Tomar, who criticizes them for eating bulk material. When McCoy tells him to taste it before he criticizes it, they notice one thing. Tomar enjoys the meal, even though it looks like Play-Doh. But they shouldn't have any human emotions, they are actually huge tentacle monsters, so they come up with a hypothesis. When the Kelvins took human form, they became more human than they planned. So because they don't really control these emotions yet, our crew has the perfect weapon against them. And this is when the episode switches from serious drama to silly comedy. Scotty takes Tomar and tries to get him drunk, because he's a Scotsman. 
and everybody knows that Scots are alcoholics who were killed and play bagpipes all day long. And what a surprise, Scotty had tons of booze hidden all over his room and has a kilt hanging on his wall. I guess the only reason there are no bagpipes visible is that the prop department couldn't get any in time, otherwise this would be the perfect Scottish stereotype. McCoy takes Haynar, he tells him that he is malnourished and starts injecting him with stimulants. Because as we have seen in many other episodes, McCoy's solutions for many of the problems are drugs. Well, it's a 60s show. Kirk of course gets the lady, at least he thinks that. He goes to Kalinda and starts kissing her on her neck, pretending that it's a normal part of an apology. Well, Today's politically correct Americans would probably use a slightly different term for it. She's confused what happened, but she still likes it, so she kisses Kirk back, when suddenly Rojan interrupts them. So good. Kirk decides to make Rojan jealous. Scotty and Tomar are still drinking, so Rojan goes to play a game of 3D chess with Mr. Spock and asks him about a human apology ritual. Spock, instead of lying to him, tells him the truth and provokes him even more. So Rojan forbids Kalinda to see Kirk ever again. After he drastically grabs her arm, he realizes that he is experiencing emotions too. Bones keeps on drugging Haynar, Scotty tries to get Tomar drunk, and Kalinda interrupts Spock and Kirk and tries to ask for another apology. Spock goes to report it to Rojan to the bridge, in reaction to which Rojan storms to them. Scotty has finally got Tomar drunk, so he can now bring his belt thingy to Kirk, after he takes a nap, of course. So, good lesson for kids, never drink with a Scotsman. By the way, never drink with a guy from Eastern Slovakia, you would probably not survive it. All we need now is an entertaining fistfight between Rojan and Kirk, and we of course get it, and it's treated as a comedy. But in the end, Kirk manages to persuade Rojan that uh, while humans would never accept them as conquerors, they might accept them as friends. So the Calvans will try a new strategy. They will try to get to the Milky Way as friends and colonize some planets without intelligent life. The end. Well, not really sure what to think about this episode. It has problems, like lack of logic in some places, and I don't like the drastic change of tone from drama to comedy, but it is a very entertaining episode. The characters are very charming, which is no surprise, since this was a script by Dorothy Fontana, my favorite classic Trek writer. The original story came from Jerome Bixby, who wrote episodes like Mirror Mirror or Day of the Dove, but it was heavily rewritten by DC Fontana, with some input by Gene Roddenberry and the producer John Meredith Lucas. According to Bixby himself, the changes were done because his script was too gruesome for 1960s television. For example, the aliens didn't change the crew members into the strange objects, but executed them by shooting them into space. Kirk was brutally tortured and a lot of serious stuff which NBC hated and requested to be changed. While to me that sounds like an also very interesting script, I think I prefer Fontana's version. This episode has an interesting home video history. If you have seen the DVD set, you have probably noticed an incorrect shot of Spock. It's during the scene where Spock plays the 3D chess with Rojan. I have a video on my channel which shows you what exactly I mean. Has anybody of the people watching this video seen the episode on television in the last century? I am trying to find out if that wrong shot was an error created for the DVD or if it was there also during the previous TV broadcasts. But back to the ratings, on my scale from 0 to 10, where 0 is absolute garbage, 10 is a masterpiece, and 5 is just average, I would give this episode 7 out of 10. It's not perfect, but definitely above average, and it's definitely worth watching. 
But maybe I'm not very objective since it's written by DC Fontana and I'm a huge fan of her work. But as always, those were just my opinions. Uh, let me know what do you think down in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, hit that thumbs up button. And if you have some free time, feel free to watch any of the other videos on my channel. You should see some links on screen right now. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching and hope to see you soon. Bye.